Hi, I am Leslie Durham. I'm a professor of geography and environmental studies at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. I know you see the word professor and you're worried about a really boring, dry lecture, but no, this is going to be exciting. You're going to learn a lot, but we have a lot to cover. We're going to talk about climate change 101, plant-based eating for individual action. So the Earth's climate system is fascinating. It is truly amazing, right? So our climate stability requires equal amounts of energy entering and leaving the system. So for us to think about our near surface temperatures, those are dependent on two factors, solar energy or light reaching the surface of the earth and terrestrial energy or heat leaving the system. Both of these are impacted by both natural forces and human or anthropogenic factors. The climate system is this super cool complex system of five different parts. The atmosphere, ice or all frozen water on the planet, the hydrosphere, land surfaces, and vegetation. And they all act together, but they also interact with one another. It's really amazing. The greenhouse effect is good. We need it, we like it, it's a good thing. People often kind of get confused about, oh, well, global warming, the greenhouse, no. So in a normal situation with normal carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxides, those are the greenhouse gases, with a normal setting, the greenhouse effect is great because it allows a certain amount of solar radiation in, it traps some to keep us nice and warm like a little blanket, and then it lets some heat escape. That's great. As opposed to Venus, our neighbor closer to the sun, it has too much of a blanket, too thick of an atmosphere with different um, substances, different gases. So it's too hot. Mars doesn't have enough of that blanket, so it's too cold. So the Earth is just right. The problem is that humans are causing an intensified greenhouse effect, and that means global warming and climate change. So basically, these greenhouse gases, which are supposed to absorb and, and emit energy, they have increased too much. There's too much of these carbon dioxide, nitrous oxides, and methane in the atmosphere. It's really amazing because these gases only make up like 0.0% of the whole atmosphere. Mostly it's, it's nitrogen, oxygen, and argon. But just that 0.04% is such a delicate system, we've really messed it up. So we're trapping more heat than we should be. We have really good data on this. So this is historical CO2 concentrations. If you look at the chart, the bottom line, that's years before present. And we have data through ice cores and other means that go back 10,000 years. And you can see the purple line there kind of going into the blue line. There's a little variation, but not much. But then when you get to the current era, 1800 on, especially 1880, and then that red line, that's actually about 1950 on, We've pulled that out to stretch that 1800 to 2000 in that little uh, set offset box. You can see this rapid increase, this huge sudden increase really in CO2 emissions. And this is post-industrialization, post-industrial food system, et cetera. So a lot of climate deniers like to say, oh, it's just a natural process. The earth warms and cools and that's natural. And climate scientists would say, no because we have really good data looking backwards. So this is actual data. This isn't pretend, this isn't assumptions, this isn't, oh, what if? This is real data. So we have real data, the bottom chart there, if you look at the natural variability. So volcan if a volcano goes off, we have more particulate matter in the air, so it would cool global temperatures. Solar flares, they, you know, deniers like to talk, oh, so it's solar flares. Well, that's the little red line there along that on that chart. So natural variability does not explain how the Earth's temperatures have changed from 1880 to 2020, okay? You have to consider the human cause factors that are affecting global temperature. That's that light blue line. And what do you know when you actually look then at the observed global warming, that's the red line on top, that chart, those are actual glo observed global warming temperatures. Those can only be explained when we include human caused factors that affect temperature. So CO2, methane, nitrous oxides, greenhouse gas emissions. So Climate modeling is amazing. It's really, really complex. Um, climatologists like to do things like general uh, circulation models. This is an example of one here, a three-dimensional numerical model of the whole climate system. 
Now let's think about that. First, we have our beautiful whole planet, but then what do we do? Well, we need to think deep down in the ocean, on up to the mixed layer, ocean and air, on over to the continent, up into the mountains, up into the atmosphere. So we're talking about uh, uh, height, right? So latitude. So not only the grids of latitude and longitude, are you near the equator, or are you near the pole, but also all these levels of from the ocean depths to the mountain tops. Think about all that data. It's really pretty cool. And scientists are really good at this. And in fact, now I'm showing you how we can model forward. So these are modeling scenarios based on hmm, human action. What are we going to do? Projected temperature change by 2090. If CO2, so if carbon dioxide emissions drop to zero by 2080. So if we start taking action right now to stop our greenhouse gas emissions and we get it down to zero by 2080, you can see the temperature there that we could keep it within two to three degrees of warming. That is maybe manageable in terms of, of mitigate, uh, in terms of adaptation, in terms of what we can do uh, to survive that. But if you look at the bottom scenario, that's when CO2 emissions triple, which is sort of like our, our current path. If we don't do anything, if we just continue. Then you see we're way up into those purples and pinks, which is something like nine or 10 degrees Fahrenheit increase. And that would, to be honest, be devastating. So when we look at this in depth, another way, you can see 1950 to 2000, that's the gray line. Those are what we know about temperatures. And then we can project it forward. So if we take action, we're smart, humans start you know, slowing or stopping our greenhouse gas emissions. We could be in that purple phase. There's still going to be warming just because we've set this path. You know, we're, we're, we've already got the, the greenhouse gases, those extra gases up there, but at least we could level out by 2100. Um, but if we continue along our current path, that's the case, scenario 39, if you will, that red line does not look good, right? That's a four degree Celsius increase uh, by the turn of the century. You may have noticed I used a lot of IPCC uh, data and charts here. It's all free, readily available. I encourage you to go to IPCC, uh, to their website. This is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It was established in 1988 by the World Meteorological Associ Organization and the United Nations Environmental Program. It act IPCC actually won a Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. Very important group. So this UN group has over 195 member countries, basically almost every country in the world is a member. And these IPC expert reports then are used by each country to develop their own climate policies. So thousands of scientists and experts assess the science of climate change and come up with these reports. Uh, they summarize thousands of research papers. They look at the drivers, what's, what's causing climate change, the impacts, the risks to people, animals, plants, places, the mitigation. So what can we do to stop this? The adaptation, what can we do to live with it if, if this happens? This is an open review pro process. Objective reports are published. I highly recommend looking at some of the IPCC uh, documents. Here's just a, a, an example. I was joking the other day, there are probably thousands of various charts, but I just pulled these because I thought they were kind of a, a neat example. So this is from one of the IPCC reports from 2013. And the top graph there shows land surface air temperature. So that's pulling from four different data sets. So maybe there's a, a European Union data set, a Chinese data set, an Australian, whatever. Various researchers doing various projects. You can see still, even with four different data sets, those temperatures line up pretty closely. So this is 2050 to 2010. And you're looking at land surface temperature there on the top. The middle chart is actually six data sets looking at sea level rise. And the bottom chart is summer Arctic sea ice, again, looking with seven data sets. So see, this IPCC is able to just pull all of this data from each national or, or you know, what, every country's experts uh, to, to, to look at these factors. And the IPCC said, well, you know, how, how do we know, people, how do we know? Evidence for a warming world comes from multiple independent climate indicators, from high up in the atmosphere to the depths of the oceans. And I just thought this schematic was so cool. So, okay, how do we know? Well, the down arrow. So uh, glacier volume is going down. Snow cover is going down. Our measurements of sea ice area 
going down, but all the others are going up. So air temperature, sea surface temperature, sea level, sea levels are rising, land over overland temperatures, et cetera. So we, we have data points all across the planet and we have experts looking at this and they're telling us what's going on. So the IPCC likes to publish these statements in each of their reports. And I just pulled a few of these that I think are really relevant for our discussion today. First, warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And since the 1950s, many of the observed changes are unprecedented over decades to millennia. Secondly, the atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide have increased to levels unprecedented in at least the last 800,000 years. Those are both pretty strong statements. I have a little asterisk there because I want to now talk about carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxides related to food. So a quarter pound burger takes uh, 460 gallons of water to produce. It uses almost 65 square feet of land. So just a quarter pound, that little, you know, a lot of people eat bigger than that. But in any case, it not only takes, but it gives back things that we don't want. So a lot of methane, methane is 23 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So it's really, it doesn't stay and last in the atmosphere as long, but it's extremely potent as a greenhouse gas. So when we talk about that quarter pound of burger, we kind of say that we're, it causes four pounds of greenhouse gas emissions. These are often given as CO2E or CO2 equivalent. So basically that is one number that's combining the carbon dioxide, which is the fossil fuel inputs, the methane, CH4, which is from manure and uh, ruminant animals, and uh, the nitrous oxides from the fertilizer and manure. We're kind of putting all of those, those greenhouse gases together and giving it as a CO2 equivalent. And you can see one chart there um, projecting scary, right, into the future of 2050 with increased growth. But I like to think people will be smarter than this. But still looking at 2005, you can see the red meat, poultry, eggs, dairy, if we could just get rid of all those from the light blue down and just focus on the staples, fruits, and veg, we would be a lot better off in terms of our uh, carbon footprint, our, our CO2E. And going back to the IPCC, we see that in a recent report, they also talk about the importance of diet and our planet. Avoiding meat and dairy is the single biggest way to reduce your impact on Earth. Meat and dairy provide just 18% of calories and 37% of protein, but take up 83% of our farmland. And impacts of the lowest impact dairy products typically exceed those of vegetable substitutes, providing new evidence for the importance of dietary change. And this is from 2019. Fun fact, so the top right there, if cattle were a country, they would rank third in greenhouse gas emissions, right behind China and very close to the United States. On the left there, the little car, if for one year, every person in the US ate no meat or cheese for just one day a week, it would be like reduce, it would be like taking 7.6 million cars off the road. Well, let's just do it for seven days a week. And then finally, the bottom, uh, graph there is about methane emissions. One cow produces about as much methane as 80 cars on the road. So how, what, how is this happening? Why is this happening? Well, because we have an agricultural industrial system. And so in industry, the goal is profits for the shareholders, the cheapest inputs with the highest outputs, inputs like fossil fuels, genetically modified seeds, fertilizers, etc. And we're doing this uh, by using concentrated animal feeding operations. CAFOs are defined by the EPA as over 1,000 head of cattle, 2,500 swine, or 125,000 chickens concentrated in one operation. There are about 20,000 in the US, but to be honest, there's no set number. You should try and search this online because there is no really comprehensive database about how many and where these are located. We do know they use about 80% of antibiotics in, in the US. And I want you to think about how in this scenario, the environment is just another input. It's like fossil fuels. It's like insects, insecticides. Now let's think a little bit about the ethics of this agricultural system. So first of all, we're slaughtering billions of land animals each year. 
that's an ethical issue for sure. Secondly, only 55% of calories produced globally actually go to food for people. The remainder go to food for biofuel and livestock. This is a very inefficient system, and that is unethical. So the conversion efficiencies, we talk about this in agriculture, right? Calories of feed in to food produced. Dairy is 17% efficiency. Eggs, 17%. Poultry, 13 Pork, 9 Beef is only 3% efficient. All the feed going in, you get 3% of food produced in terms of calories. If we grew food crops for direct human consumption, we could increase food calories by 70% and feed 4 billion more people. And here's a map that shows this. It would be easier to feed the planet if more of the crops we grew ended up in human stomachs. So on this graph, the, on this map, the green is actual food for people. That's where food for people is being grown. And the purple is food for feed, for livestock, basically, right? Food for animals and fuel. And as we all know, there is terrible undernourishment and um, across the planet, something like 800 and 23 million people are estimated to be chronically undernourished. This was from 2020. So people need to know this, right? This just seems so obvious. Agriculture is a huge component of our greenhouse gas emissions. There are a lot of different estimates because it depends on, you know, people do this real narrow view. Oh, I'm just going to look at the amount of energy it costs to take the cow to the market. Well, no, you need to think about the crops, the, the fertilizer, the agrochemicals, the gasoline, the machinery, transportation, feedlot, slaughter, refrigeration, marketing. And when you look at it that way, agriculture is 25 to 30 percent of all human caused or anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. And meat and dairy is especially high in greenhouse gas emissions. Why don't we label it? Why don't we have like a food, like, you know, the usual nutrition label and then a carbon facts label. Here's a cheeseburger. It doesn't look good. The carbon to, pro to product ratio is terrible, right? But people need to know this. People need to know, if you look at the infographic here on the right, we can drastically change the way we use cropland. If replacing beef with plant, if we just replace beef with plants in the US, we could reduce our, our amount of cropland by 90% going to the, you know, because we're just feeding livestock. We could reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. We could reduce our nitrogen fertilizer use, which also feeds in, adds into greenhouse gas emissions. Well, luckily there is increasing interest and increasing research on this. And this was an article a few years ago in The Economist. Check out that graph, pretty interesting. And they say, quote, absolute veganism unsurprisingly is the most environmentally friendly diet. Die-hard leaf eaters can claim to have knocked off 85% off their carbon footprint. And you can see the average American diet there, over 2,000 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per person per year. And down at the very bottom is the vegan. And some would argue we've, we could also do away with the sugars and oils. That would make it like, what, maybe 200 or 250 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per year. Let's bring this back. Don't forget the, the main theme here <laughs> is uh, climate change. And so if we look at the trends, we absolutely see that we are getting increasingly warmer and warmer. So that zero line, if you think of the, the, the main line going across there, that's the average temperature from uh, 1951 to 1980. That's the line. When you see the blue below, those were years that were cooler average temperatures. And then when you see the yellows and the oranges and the reds, those are the years that are higher, warmer than that mean, warmer than that average. This is data from over 6,000 meteorological stations on land, at sea, in the Arctic. And you need to know that Earth's temperature has risen more than two degrees Fahrenheit since the 1880s. And here's a quote from one of the lead researchers. The last seven years have been the warmest seven on record, typifying the ongoing dramatic warming trend. But he says, we have to expect that these records will continue to be broken. How have we been handling them? Create incentives for a non-meat diet. How about tax credits for eating healthy? Subsidies for bean and veggie producers. That, would, that makes perfect sense from a societal point of view. We aren't doing that yet but we should, so instead we have to take personal action. And one key way to do this is to choose a plant-based diet. 
one calorie of animal protein requires 11 times as much fossil fuel energy input as one calorie of plant protein. We can mitigate climate change by choosing a plant-based diet. Of course, the PCRM knows this, and we talk about the power plate all the time, fruit, grains, veggies, and legumes. And I would also argue that we could think of the power plate as better for the people and better for the planet. Thanks so much for your time.